Welcome to another edition of the Victory Life Legacy Spotlight. I got a very, very special guest in the building today in the house, whatever, wherever, uh, you know, you want to call it. But um, this guy means a lot to me, man. We have Ronya Whitaker on the spotlight today. We're going to highlight his legacy, his journey. Um, I met Ron Yell uh, his, <laughs> on a recruiting visit. It was so crazy. I met Ron Yell. I knew about Ron Yell because I saw him play in high school. And, you know, you when, you when you play at Virginia Tech or whatever school you play at, you are familiar with guys that school is targeting, especially us being both from the 757 Tywood area. You know the up-and-coming up players. And, um, you know, God is amazing. I met this young man. Uh, on his visit with my cousin, <laughs> and we're going to talk about that later today uh, in our in our um, interview. But from that moment on, man, I was blessed by his energy, his comedy, his insight. So I'm going to let him tell his story today. So, Ronyel, first off, man, how you doing? I'm good, man. Good, man. Just you know, two feet hit the ground. I'm always blessed every day I wake up, and I got an opportunity to do that. You know, especially in these crazy times right now, but. Life's good, man. Life's good. You know, I'm about seven months into a marriage now. You know, it's a little different, but congratulations. You know, <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> Thanks, man. I appreciate it. But it's awesome though, man. It's, it's, it's the best thing, you know, uh, honestly, that's ever happened to me, you know, and uh and I wouldn't trade it for the world. But life is good, big bro. Life is good. Yeah, man. And and I'm I'm happy. I I I, I appreciate you. Uh, sharing the love on, on the book, on Facebook, and you guys have the coolest relationship. You have fun together, um, you know, and, you know, I've known you for a long time, so I know she's a special woman <laughs> to, de- oh, yeah. to be with you and your entertainment size, your hard work, your passion, you're outspoken. So let's talk about, let's go back. Let's go back to when it all started. Let's go back to the 75. Let's go back to the south side of the eastern region, Norfolk. Let's talk about growing up. Like, before you got into sports, before you got into all the different things you did on the field, the interviews, let's talk about growing up in Norfolk and what you saw, you know, and who influenced you, who took care of you, and some of the, you know, things you had to overcome. Well, it was, a, um, it's, a, you know what, my, my wife told me to just be deuce, you know, be deuce, so. It's, um, <laughs> it, uh, it, it was, it was interesting growing up in, in Young's Park, you know, uh, in, in the housing project, which, you know, 80, 90% of the athletes, especially black athletes, you know, kind of grew up in those areas. Uh, but, um, it was one of those things where I had to kind of grow up faster than, you know, what my age was, um, only because, you know, my, my father went to prison for murder, you know, and, uh, my mom was dealing with her issues with drugs and things of that nature. And, and, you know, she had me when she was young, you know, so that, so still trying to live her life and, and understand what life was all about was what she was going through. Um, but that, that, like I said before, that forced me to grow up faster and become kind of like a father figure to my siblings. Um, and, and that was one thing where, you know, it, it built a callus on my skin, so to say, you know, being older as a man now, going through those experiences where I, Virginia Tech wasn't an idea. The pros wasn't the idea, you know. This, this stuff wasn't. It was. It was just day to day that I'm able to get up, and my mom was allowing me to play football. Then that's what it was. It, it, it wasn't no plan to this, you, you know. And uh, especially being at that age, uh, trying to understand exactly where am I gonna fit in this thing, you know? Because when when I was growing up, I didn't want to be like Mike. I wanted to be like Big Tony on the corner. Mm-hmm. You know, it, yeah. growing up in that in that environment, you know, you it, you just didn't have a lot of you know big time role models unless it was like a dope dealer that knew that you had some form of talent or you had something that you know they didn't allow you to get in those streets. Luckily for me, I had Sweet P. Whitaker in my life, so you know <laughs> they they won't having that. You know those drug dealers won't having that. They they won't let me get no involved in that. But there was also a situation where. I still kind of fell into it, you know, because it's hard. You know, your, your your family's not around a lot to say no all the time, but your boys are always around to say yes, you know. So mm-hmm. it's one of those things where you just follow the crowd. You know, you go from point A to point B and don't understand what C is all about until you're older. You're like, whoa, 
that was that was a drug deal. That was a drug deal, you know. You know, <laughs> you know, you, you, you're thinking, you think I'm just taking this brown paper bag from here to here, and you know, and, and that's it. But um, growing up in Young's Park, it, it was huge for me. You know, there's a lot of people, you know, uh, 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 that helped me along the way and have me to have that greater understanding of it was more to just these project walls and gates. You know, uh, it was it was a ton of people, you know, uh, Dominique Wiggins, you know, my cousin, uh, my aunt Muji, you know, my uh, one of my close friends, uh, Montel Tillery. You know, a, a lot of those guys kind of made sure that things for me stayed on the straight and narrow, but it was still hard because I was a kid, you know, and, and I didn't understand that, oh, just because I'm nine years old and I'm playing with 16 and 17 year olds on football and they picking me first, I don't quite get this. Yeah, you, you know, I, I still didn't quite get it, you know. To me, it was just a, a thing where it was like, okay, it's something to do, so let's just do it. You know, whether it was finding mattresses, you know, and tumbling, or whether it's uh, going to, you know, truck stations and getting the big inner tools and tumbling. You know, I, I tell a lot of people now, <laughs> man, it, it, see, you know exactly what I'm I talking know, about. I, that's why I say I had the visual in my head. I remember that, man. See? <laughs> and, and, and people don't understand that a lot of those guys at that time, those guys could have been Olympians. With some yeah. of the you know stuff that they did, they could have been Olympians, man. You know, uh, but at the same time, you know, growing up in Norfolk, you know, I, I you know me, big fella. I rep it to the end. I rep Young's Park to the end because that's a place where I know why I, I I never forget where I come from. And and it sounds cliche, but those words are big, you know. And, and ooh, you know, for a lot of people who may not know who I'm talking about, uh, Michael Vick, uh, he. Same situation. He, you know, when he told his stories, it's the same thing. You're trying to figure out, like, how do I figure a way to maintain every day, have fun, be a kid, and just enjoy life? It wasn't about getting out because it was no plan. It was, it was yeah, no, no blueprint on how to get out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, you know. So, like, like Big say, wicked jump shot or you sling a crack route is one or the other. You, you know, and and luckily for me, I had a. I had kind of a guidance with my uncle where I can kind of see, you know, what, what the light is if, if, if I continue to kind of just do the right things, you know. And it was hard. You know, it was hard. Uh, you know, went through well, some it was also hard, too, because I'm only a few years older than you and Mike and all the guys that came in after me. And I was over in Newport News and Hampton. But up and down the East Coast and really across the country, the era of the drug dealer, in the eight, late 80s and 90s began to skyrocket. Like that, that became the trend. And what you talk about over on the south side on Young's Park in Norfolk, even it was occurring where me and Oop was growing up. And that's what we saw. And you know, if you reflect on it, it was crazy because um, looking back now, you're like, wow, it was, it was bananas, all the, you know, the crime, the killing, the hustling. And yet, you know, we were just kids around it. You know, and you didn't know any better and you didn't even think anything was wrong, but we were very fortunate to come out. I want to talk about your uncle because before I met you at Tech, everybody knew your uncle. It won't even, it was crazy because I remember when I was a young and sitting, you know, just back when cable first started coming out and Sweet Pea was fighting and he was captivating. And you played with that same charisma, but, you know, of course, I didn't see you play yet. Your uncle was, an amazing boxer. I still remember when he got robbed against De La Hoya. You know what I'm saying? I, I, you know, that's another story for another podcast. But <laughs> just give him, you know, God rest his soul, but give him his, what do you think? Like his just do as far as how he impacted you, your family, his legacy for a minute. Yeah, he, my, my uncle is, uh, is awesome, man. He was awesome. You know, it's my mother's younger brother, of course. Uh, it was one of those situations where he started a lot of stuff w with boxing that people don't understand how guys like Floyd Mayweather and all these other people can benefit from the, the life of it now, you know. And growing up with that, you know, I always hated because, you know, especially when I started going to like high school and all those other things, it was always a situation where like, oh, that's Ryan Yo Whitaker. Oh, that's Sweepy Whitaker's nephew. You know, it was, and I hated that. I hated it, but I didn't understand until later, you know, as a young man that, yeah, for him to be five foot seven, his shadow was huge. 
-hmm. you know, and a lot of us was in it, whether we wanted to be in it or not, you know, and, uh, and, you know, like you say, with the whole, uh, you know, Oscar De La Hoya and, and, you know, the Chavez senior fights and all those other things, a lot of people don't understand this. If you look back when the, uh, and I think my, my aunt or my grandma still has the Ream magazine, but he's on the front of it and, and they're talking about how to describe each boxer from their weight division to see who's number one. And they came up with this title called Pound for Pound. And this was like, uh, this was like in the 90s, early 90s. And no one knew what Pound for Pound was, but it was trying to dictate between the Tysons of the world yeah. and the smaller guys and who was on top of their game at that point. Yeah. And that Pound for Pound title was created because of Sweet Pea. Yeah. You know, um, um, the, contract, the contract fights was created because of Sweet Pea. You know, I, I remember when they talked about him signing the five-year deal, 76 million, Azuma Nelson, Buddy McGirt, Oscar uh, De La Hoya, Felix Trinidad, Senior, uh, uh, Julio Cesar Savage, Senior. Those were the five major fights in order to get that contract. Nobody was doing that. Floyd just started doing that. The golden era. The golden era of boxing. The golden era. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. You know, and, and, and growing up in that era, it was, it was a time where I was able to see, okay, this is how you be, this is how you be a professional. This is how you carry yourself. This is how you can dominate the sport if you do this stuff when other people are not watching. So when people are not watching and you're able to get in that ring and dipsy do, or as, or as Coach Beamer would say, give a little doodad and all this other stuff, you know, it's one of those things where you can't hit a guy, you know? And, and, and it became the art of the defense where it was like, whoa, this guy is must-see TV. And, and, and that grew on me. That grew on me where I was like, you know what, I'm going to work hard off the field. So when I got on the field, you know, I, I was the headline, blockbuster. You, you, you know what I mean? And, and it was just one of those things where a lot of people think that the way we are, whether it's me, my uncle, you, Mike, uh, Ronald Kerr, you know, uh, 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 Dre Bly, Plexico, anybody from our area, you know, if you look at us, we all have a swagger. We all have a swagger. Yeah. And, 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 and they can say what they want to say as, as far as like, it's something in the water or however you want to, you know, look at it, you know, but all of us, we walk with a different tune in our head being from that area, being from the seven, five, seven, you know, seven area, you know, it is, we're all, it's almost like we're all alike. You know, my wife look at TV all the time and she's like, he must be from the seven, five, seven. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. We talk. My daughter does that. My oldest daughter always, and my son, Isaiah, they both do that. Sydney and Isaiah both will say, he sounds like he's from down your way. I was like, oh, he is. And then she'll be like, she'll roll her eyes because, you know, they, they in Northern Virginia. They hate it. And I'm like, look, <laughs> it is what it is. You just need to embrace it, man. But, you know, one last point about your uncle, man. I remember the thing about, you talk about that 757 mystique and what we had, especially during the golden era of boxing and even high school sports. What I remember about Sweet Pea was not just his skill set, but was it was that saying, oh, when he fighting, he had in Norfolk, oh, he ain't losing. If he if he was fighting at home, it was almost like how we say, "Oh, where the game at? It's over on the south side. They cross the water. Oh yeah, they ain't oh, on our side, Peninsula. Oh, because the home crowd advantage he had, it wasn't even the fact that he was gonna get the, the, the benefit of the doubt with the judges. It was the fact that he was on one in Norfolk. Like it, it 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 was no one close to his level, and then he had that energy of the crowd behind him. The streets, I remember being a youngin, but it was just a buzz when he was fighting back home. And it was just great, man. It was just, he he left still an impactful legacy, man. And, and to say that, I, I, I always knew that when, speak, piggybacking on what you're saying with, as far as fighting from home is, fighting at home is when, like, he wanted to also make sure when he fought at home, it was a show. So, yeah. so you're going to get an office state band. You gonna get all this good stuff, you know. When, when, when uh, Roger Mayweather comes into the scope, the whole Young's pot is there. People coming through the tunnel, through the water, understanding uh -huh. that it's showtime, and, and and that's what he gave you because it was home. It was home, and he knew that the people that that was gonna fill that uh, arena up knew that we we expect something different from you here. Mm -hmm. you know, we don't care what you do in the garden. We don't care what you do at MGM. We don't care what you do at Caesars. When you come to the scope. Or the Hampton Coliseum, we expect something different, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's what he gave us, and that's what he yeah. gave us. Yeah. So now it's your turn. You're growing up. You're young. And when did that journey start for you specifically? Was it a 
a rec travel football team? Do you remember when you first put the helmet on? And what happened after that? Like, let's go back. So now it's your turn. You are, you up next. What happens? So, so before getting into uh, high school, I, I always wanted to play. Uh, 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 just I just wanted to play rec. You know, so I'd be like 14, 15 years old, still trying to make weight. You know, and for a lot of people who don't know what that is, in these days, you know, you had to take off your shirt, your socks, and all that just to make sure you made the weight. <laughs> and I got to a point where I could never make weight. And my my best friend Alvin uh, Alvin Eason he used to come to all the games on Saturdays, all the games at, at at Lakeville, all the games, all the games. And we and I could never make the weight. And all he would say is, "Man, you want to go get a hot dog? Let's go get a hot dog." You know, I probably owe him about five hundred grand worth of hot dogs right now. But uh, but that's my man, though. Shout out to him. But he um. He always just told me to never let myself get down from that. And finally, he told me, he was like, Ron, you about to go into the ninth grade. Why are you still trying to play Super Bantam and all this? You know, why not just go to uh, high school, play JV? Oh, as a matter of fact, Ron, there's a, uh, a, um, a passing league at Maury High School. You should go. I go. I meet this coach, I meet this coach named Bert Hurl. And, uh, and, from there, he told me, yeah, you should come out for the team. And I was like, fine. You know, but I added in my mind that I'm going to just go and I'll be, I'm going to go play JV and see what this is all about. And my uncle Bruce Manley, who's, a, uh, who's also a um, two-time, three-time All-American off state, you know, uh, uh, played with the Seahawks and all this big time. He was like, no, nah, nephew, you got to try for varsity. If you're not good, they'll drop you to JV. So, fine. Now I got a plan. Okay, because I don't want to play varsity. I almost don't want to damn near play JV. That's why I kept trying to play Super Bantam, you know. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't. You didn't want to. You didn't want to play it. I, I, did, I did. Uh, I think it was just the fear of. It was the fear of people being better than you are. Yeah. And, and going from Young's Park and playing those little leagues until I ended up, you know, uh, moving with my grandparents. You know, because we had ended up getting evicted through some other stuff or whatever. And that's how I ended up living with my grandparents in Azalea, you know. That's how we moved up, kind of like the Jeffersons a bit, you know. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, so, and so I knew that, you know, like, man, I, I, it's going to be people better than me. You know, I went from Young's Park where we had one uniform, the Clovers, love them to death, my favorite team of all time. But then we moved to Azalea, they had like three, four different uniforms. I was like, I'm no not ready for this. Yeah. You know, what, what is this? this? This is ran like an organization. They got cookouts. They got all type of sports. You know, you can buy uh, 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 swag and all this other stuff. And, and I just wasn't ready for it. But then when my uncle told me to play uh, go for varsity and, and they'll drop the JV if you're not good, I say, fine. I showed up. I goofed around in practice, played around because I was like, I'm going to play JV anyway. I don't know why I'm doing this. But, of course, you knew at that time JV and varsity had to practice together, together. until they figured this stuff out. Yeah. You know, next thing you know, opening day, Coach Earl comes to me and tell me, oh, you are playing varsity. You're going to start at corner, and you're going to play all our returns. You're going to return every punt and every kick. And uh, and I said, oh, I, 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 all right, I guess. You know, you know you're, you're, in, you're in ninth grade? I'm in ninth grade. I'm a freshman. And this is Lake, T uh, Lake Taylor, right? Lake Taylor. This is Lake yeah. Taylor High School. And, yeah. and I remember showing up, and, you know, we had some studs, you know, uh, 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 Louder, uh, 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 Donnell Whitaker, you know. Uh, but it was this one guy in particular. He was a senior. And I never forget him because he reminded me of Anthony Lambeau to this day. <laughs> he told me, he said, look, young fella, because everybody, because I was the only freshman on the team. And, and everybody, it was some guys that understood it, some guys that didn't, some guys thought it was some sweepy magic or something or whatever, talk, you know, whatever. And... Brian Lottlier just straight up told me, look, man, you want to get the respect of these seniors on this team? You run a kickback tonight. We'll respect you. First time I touch it, we housed it. Housed it against Churchland. Housed it at uh, uh, Harbor Park, and the rest was history. And that's thing, though, I was just off and rolling then. And, and, and oh, then it felt more comfortable. Off the jump, off the rip, first one. First time. First time I touched it, we go house. For like 92 yards, we go house. I come to the sideline, and, and Brian Lockley grabs me. He was like, all right, all right, we can deal with it. <laughs> now, now, they didn't say they like me. They say they can deal with it. And then I end up returning the kick the next week, 
and then the so on and so on and so on and and the rest and, and the rest was just like literally the rest was history because I knew at that point I can play with these guys, especially when I had an opportunity to go to a Western branch and they were stacked with the Chiron Stiths, the the Dre Blys. They they had them all. They had them all. Lorenzo you know? was there. Lorenzo was there, <laughs> Ferg was there, you know, everybody was there, you know. And I went there and I was I was backing up the running back, Richard Johnson. Uh and I had like 87 yards. You know, I had like 87 yards on three curves. Then I had like a, a, a punt return, a kick return for a touchdown. But I couldn't break the starting lineup because he was a senior. So I had to wait my time, you know. But as many seniors that fought for me, Coach Hurl had his thing. Look, wait your time, young fellow. This is a senior that, you know, and this is his time, you know. And from there, I just knew that at that point, I can play with these guys now. But I was still a pup. You know, you know. So you you get off to a great run. By the time you're a senior, and if you've seen now, you mentioned you watched my other podcast. I talked to Mike and even Ahmad Hawkins and everybody. I'm, I love the young kids that's in Virginia now, especially down our way or in Richmond. But I've always said, especially in recent years, from the late '80s up till the early 2000s, right around when Tyrod was playing. That was the golden era for the for Virginia high school, especially sports, especially in the Tywood and Hampton Roads region. Yep. When you were, by the time you're a junior and senior, are you aware? I know you know about Iverson and the guys that came before you, but were you aware across the water what was going on in the PD with with uh, with Mike and Ron? And I mean, because you know back then we didn't have the internet. It was basically mm-hmm. wavy TV ten Friday night lights. You know, so yep, you yep. saw, you know, because I mean, I knew what was going on in my time across. So I, I saw Norcom and Jay Clark and those guys, but you know, you're a few years younger than me. Were you aware? Was it like a, a special? Because I know, and for those watching this, everyone back home knows in the 7 5, the Peninsula and Southside have a rivalry. Yep. You know, <laughs> in every sport. And then when we get away from home, we, we, we link up. But yep. growing up, you know, when you go across the water, you had to you had to tighten your strap. Even if you were going the military highway, to shop. And if y'all came across, it was and it wasn't no beef, but it was also competition. And you know, like yo, our side's the best. So did you feel like, oh yeah, Mike and Ron, they all right, but they not on our side. Like, did you were you aware? Did, what were you thinking? Oh, I knew exactly <laughs> what they were. I knew it, I knew exactly what they were. Cause we cause cause kids out there listening to this. Like he just told you, we didn't have internet. But we had these college books called Lundies that we used to go to the grocery store. I used to save my money to go get these books. And I knew that, okay, this is the top guy in the country. This this is this. Oh, oh, there's Kerry, there's Vic, there's Blizzard, there's Hawkins, there's, you know, I, I you know, uh, my man uh Javon Quillen, like, you know, uh, uh Marlon Hicks. Like I knew about all these guys that just, you know. Whether it was at war, whether it was at Kickatan, no matter where it was, you know, Hampton, uh, that was kind of my connection link to understand what was going on on the other side. And then once that happened, I remember just saying to myself, anytime we had a bye or anytime uh, one of you guys played, one of your schools played on a Saturday, because y'all stayed doing that. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, well, that's oh, because no. we got games moved to Saturday, especially when Hampton versus Newport News or even Hampton versus Phoebus because of, as you know, the violence. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we, I hate it Saturday because, you know, when you were in high school, you, you, you were trying to get to that weekend. So Saturday at noon, you were like, really? But it was for our own safety. Yeah. Right. And, 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 see, and, I, and, and I didn't know that. I thought it was something where I was like, these cats play on the same day college play. <laughs> like, like, let me get a one o'clock game, you know. But, but at the same time, like you said, Nothing like the lights. Nothing like the Friday night lights. Nothing. Nothing, nothing like, like it. You know? Nothing. But, but I remember going to I remember going to see Mike play for the first time. Uh, my junior year, they were playing Hampton, and my buddy Ryan Sutton took me to a game. You know, and and he was like, "Man, you got to see this guy named Michael Vick." Man, I was like, "I know who he is." He was like, "Yeah, but you got to see him. He dates my cousin." You know, and I was like, "Oh, okay, all right, cool." So I went or whatever, and. <laughs> Lord have mercy. I was like, I, I need to work harder. 
<laughs> I really need to work harder. Because the difference between the two was he played quarterback, so he touched the ball 100% of the time. At that point in my career, I was playing everything. I was playing, you know, running back, then I kick return, punt return, safety corner, you know. So I was able to have the ball as many or have an opportunity to touch the ball as many times, but not like this guy. And and, and I was able to see his – I was able to see the last podcast, and, and, and he was right. He didn't know about schemes or eight-man boxes. It was really like watching high school football, but I mean, uh, backyard football, but it was polished. It wasn't like he was just dropping back and just yeah. feeding it. He was dropping yeah. back and, and looking and looking and then letting it go, you, you know? So yeah. it was some backyard football there, but it was so polished. He was so electric that it, it, it was unreal because I, I already knew what Averson was. I knew Averson accomplishments. I knew how dope he was and, and just like just sheer just the man you know and then ronald himself i just called that dude ronald and ron c, <laughs> <laughs> and ron c. now yo it's we i do that too i look i i mess around and, and call mookie reggie one time and he forgot <laughs> i was talking to him but those listen, Mookie's one of our teammates, but we know he's Reggie now in the in corporate. Yeah, America. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he um but I, I knew about Ron and I knew I knew Ron was the guy because I, I saw him on, on the spotlight every Friday night, you know, after the games were over. He was the guy. And 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 that was one thing that, you know, I was like, man, hey man, I don't, I don't know if this, I don't know if Ron that good, man. I mean, I know he good, but I never had a chance to see him in person until when I went to go see Mike. And I was like, I see Ron on highlights. I'm seeing Mike live and this is must see TV. Uh, this boy was must see TV, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and he wasn't as big as Ron. You know, a lot of people don't know that. Like when people meet Mike now, Mike, 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 you know. Yeah, but you know, you're right about that. Ahmad and uh, Marcus Higgins talked about that. And I remember it because I've known Ron forever. Ron was 6'4 and thick, like strong. You know, Mike was, Mike didn't become like like you mentioned until that Gen P, Gentry. Mike Gentry mm -hmm. got a hold of him, mm -hmm. the strength coach formerly at Virginia Tech. So, yeah, yep. you're right about that. And, and that's and that's what kind of gave me the difference where I was like, okay, now I'm seeing certain guys where I'm kind of seeing what their game is like. You know, I, I you know, Ron was just a, 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 he was just a different creature. But when I went to go see Mike, it was like, it was like watching Charlie Ward, you know. And, and, and when I went to go, and, and when I saw Marlon Hicks play, it was like watching a, a Warren Sapp, you, you know. It was, it was these things where I was able to take these guys and be like, man, these cats are like, you know, these cats are, are real over here. And, and I'm not getting to just do from just the magazines or the highlights from a TV until I went out there and watched them play. And I was like, this cat, Michael Vick, is is he's over, he's been overshadowed by this guy because he's yeah. just as good, you know. But then one Sunday afternoon, I saw Ronald Kerr on NFL films, and I was like, I'm done. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Well, listen, you know what, man? I said, and I wish well, I had the internet back when I said this, because when I was at Virginia Tech, I told guys at the farmhouse, it's where we used to eat at on Friday nights, the weekend of a game. And I said, after he was getting ready to make his decision, his season was over. He was heading into, you know, his, his graduation. I told guys, yo, anytime you're the national Gatorade player of the year in football and basketball, which has not been done since, and I don't think it was done prior, and you on the cover, TV guys, NFL films are doing stories on you. You are, in regards to height, you're LeBron before LeBron. You know, like, you know, I called him, I, we didn't use the word go back then. I just said, yo, he's just special. There's nothing like that. But at the same time, you held your own um, on the south side and throughout the state. Real quick before we talk about that all-star game you guys are on. Cool. On your on your side of the water, who were some of the big matchups you had with? Like, who were some of the guys that you were like, okay, you know, your junior and senior year, like, you know, you mentioned Sharon and Dre Bly and those guys over at Western Branch were like, were any other body else in your district? Omari, you know, Booker T, anybody else? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, especially Booker T, you know, you had the Kevin Fullers. He was on our all-star team. You know, uh, you had the, the uh, uh, Ron Lees of the world, you know, the Ronald Marcus. You know, the, uh, 
it, it, it's so many, you know, the Plessico Burrises, the Dion Dyers, you know, it, uh, uh, it's, it was so much talent with Larry Austin, James Whitley. Larry Austin and them, that year they came out, they had 19 cats go D1. Yeah. Yeah, no, they high school. <laughs> no, I know of you, right? Yeah, Dwayne yeah. Potts, all those guys, you know, uh, that uh, Eric Hines and, you know, from just from all those schools and, and being able to see so much talent through there where it was a, it was a situation where I knew that every year I had to be more and more on top of my game. So when my sophomore year, when I went all Tower, I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. Until <laughs> Kat started to tell me, no, no, this is, this is better than cool. And I was like, all right. And then sophomore year, all tight water. And then senior, all tight water player and player of the year. And I'm like, was, was, it's not as easy as people think. It, it just seems that way. Because you, you, you're falling behind so many footsteps that was before you. No, you no. know, like the, the if, if I could sit here and reel off all the names from the cats, you know, from that side, I, I'll be here all day. You know, no. and at the same time, I, I don't show justice because I'm going to miss somebody. Well, no, so just like people, you said, yeah. yeah, people know that. You look, but you know, yeah. I hear you talk about Larry Austin. I forgot about how dynamic that Norview team was in that era. But that just reinforces the point is that, you know, I see now, and I love the fact that these youngins now have the access to Twitter, Instagram, and you have Recruit 757, and you have Matt Hatfield, all these guys that covered ESPN. 94.1, you know, the radio, television access is a blessing for these kids because it creates more exposure. But at the same time, I think it's saturated the work ethic and it's, manu it's almost like manufactured hype for some of these guys. Because I've been doing this podcast now for a while in regards to not just the Victory Life one, but I've been doing stuff with other guys on radio shows with my man Kyle Bailey, different people. And rankings and all that stuff is is important to some degree but it almost blinds the judgment for the kids involved because i hear you and i've talked to some really great players and great people the last three weeks and the constant theme i hear from you and everyone else is we were just playing i was just working out i realized i had to work hard nothing came easy i didn't even know i was that good and now it's reverse, where a lot of young people now, and again, I love you. I have a son and daughter. All three of my kids are athletes. But humility is lacking, not my, with my kids, but in general. Like everyone now will post and tell you how good they are. And what's amazing is, I'm not going to say the competition has dropped off because there's talent, but when you mention on your side alone, those guys you mentioned, Deion Dyer, guys going D1, at several positions, that is not the case of norm anymore, you know? And it's almost like, yeah, you're good, but you're not, you need to calm down a little bit because the, the higher you go, the harder it gets. Yep. Does it make sense? It, it makes a lot of sense. And, and, and I'm glad you spoke about that because I, I try to tell a lot of young cats that. I, I try to tell them just that, you know? I'm like, yeah, that, that's great, you know, that, that you, like my thing, this, this is my thing that I just found out. <clears throat> There's a lot of cats that young cats in, in this generation, and trust me, I love them all. I love to watch them play, just like you said. I love everything about it, you know. But I noticed that I see a lot of people talk about, you know, um, um, I like to say thanks to XYC school for uh, recruiting me and, you know, and this and that. And I come to find out that, like, these ain't scholarships. These are just somebody that showed up and talked to you. You know, like, 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 you, you, and, and that's what killed me because I had to ask people. I'll be like, man, so, man, did you see Michigan and such and such and such as we at the school? He's like, yeah, they, they just came to stop by to talk. I was like, but on his, but on their social media saying, thanks for the visit. Yeah, so yeah, I'm thinking, because yeah. trust me, when, when, when Bobby Bowden and Frank Beamer and all these other coaches come, it won't no conversation. It was about what are you gonna do, you know? <laughs> and, and 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 we I, we wasn't ready for that. It seemed like the it seemed like the, the newer generation now. Those guys are they. It, I look at it more as them branding. They look more as a brand, and that makes sense, you know. And, and I love it, and I love it because they're exposed to so much, so much social media, so much everything is is a right now 
time, you know, but, but, you know, like I said before, it's one of those things where when we were out there playing, we didn't know what the next step was going to be. When you play high school, you don't know that, oh, college is going to be this to lead to this to lead to this. You don't know that, you, you know, you're just thinking, I just want to keep playing. I yeah. want to keep playing and keep playing and keep playing and keep playing because I love to play. And that's all it was, you know, and, and, and the funny thing about it is these kids now, a lot of them are so dynamic. Oh, they special. So dynamic, oh, they you know. They special. They special. But, yeah, but and then I, then when I turn around and I see that the other flip side to it that could be a little ugly for them that I'm glad that we didn't have a lot of our generation didn't have because you don't want to see Ron Yell Whitaker on social media in the tenth grade. You don't want that. You, you, you know what I mean? Like these, a lot of these kids now, they got parents. Like you said, you, you know, like your kids, they play sports, so they have someone to kind of polish that. To kind of polish that and say, "Whoa, hold up, hold up." Mm -hmm. don't, you know, you can do this, but make sure you do it the right way, like this. We didn't have that. What you saw was what you're going to get. You, you know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. so when you saw David Terrell and all these guys. That, that's what you got, you know, when you, when you saw Ron C, that's what you got, you know, and, and, and that was the beauty of it, because it was the, the purest of my, of my time as playing high school and getting ready for college. I felt that that was the purest thing because, you know, it, it, it was a thing where, like I said before, you either saw us on highlights or you saw us in a college magazine. We were able to try to break down who is who. So we was already like doing basically scouting reports at a young age. For sure. You know, now they just turn on social media. Yeah, and, and you know what? I'm glad you brought up David Terrell because that year, and again, this is always a debate, you know, no matter what generation, you know, the OGs before me, they said, oh, y'all was nice, but y'all couldn't. Have. Look, I'm not going to do that on this show, and I'm not going to do that for the most part because it's to me it's all about what your perspective is. Mm -hmm. But David Terrell, yourself, Mike, uh, you mentioned Marlon Hicks, uh, I mean, come on, dog. Like, first of all, Quillen, Javon Quillen, the dad, not the son that played at Tech, the dad. I can go on, you name them. That all-star team, I remember I was at Tech, and I was I had pride because at that time, it wasn't just the 757 repping in, in all of Virginia going at it. The v, at that time, the, being a VHSL all-star player was a huge honor. Yep. Um, but I remember it was a lot of y'all on that team. Lee Sizzle. Lee Suggs. Debo Anthony, Debo Anthony Davis. Yes. So <laughs> he helped me break one of them runs. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, man. I, I remember being at Tech, and I remember uh, we were arguing about, because when I came out, it was me, Tony Morris, and Aaron Brooks, Anthony Poindexter, and some other guys. And I remember I told Tony Mo, I said, this might be, you know, one of the best all-star teams ever assembled. Not just on the East, but the East and West. And I couldn't get back because we had summer conditioning. You know how that go. I was at Tech. But do you remember that team and what it was like? Was there trash talk? Um, like the, the egos? Not so much y'all were arrogant, but, you know, that's talent. You know, then David Terrell, quick side note, he was the man, too, went to Michigan, won number one, which is a big deal back in the day. I remember him in the paper saying he turned down the invite because he felt he was better than y'all and better than Ron. And I wanted to see all of that. Even though they would have been on the same team, knowing my coach, Coach Smith, he would have found a way to put them on opposite teams. <laughs> so take me back there, Ron, uh, Ron Yell. Like, what do you remember, man, about everything? The, 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 the players, the, comp the trash, the memories? I, to I told myself I would never bring up the uh, – David Terrell story, but here we go. <laughs> so we all, so we all, you know, you get your invite. My invite went into the, my invite went into the frame the next day. My grandma bought a frame for it because I, I knew how important that game was, but I didn't know truly how important it was until my grandparents started explaining to me that this is, this is huge, you yes. know? You know, she, she, she was like, understand how good this, and she, and my grandfather, my uncle started to reel off like old all-star teams with all these, you know, with the AIs and with all these, you know, with everybody, you know, and, and I guarantee a lot of those teams that they were talking about, you want them, you, you know what I mean? You know, so we all get the invite and we all show up day one. 
And of course, I don't really know too many people there. So I, so me and Kevin Fuller hanging with each other. He from Booker T. We both grew up in Young's Park. So we like, look, we're going to kick it with each other, you know what I mean, until we get to know everybody else. So we all get there, Coach Smith, uh, day one. Oh, day one, day, first of all, day one won't know sizing for equipment and all that stuff, you know what I mean? You know, it was, it was let's get the business. Yeah, and then we did the equipment stuff the next day. So I go into the, so we go into the uh, equipment room, and I'm like, "This is a university." Hampton was like a universe. <laughs> that thing was ran like a business. Coach, get all the team together. Hey guys, I want to make an announcement. We're like everybody, you know, everybody kind of like you know gathered around or whatever. And he was like, uh, "David Terrell will not be joining us this year in the All Star game." Uh, for, for reasons that we're not going to get too involved in. And, you know, I didn't play with Coach Smith, but I know Coach Smith. And once he say that, that's it. That's a one-way conversation. You know what I mean? You know, he was like, stuff that we're not going to get too involved into. Uh, but let's just say that we understand that the guys that we have on this field right now are even better, even without him. So that yeah. told us, oh yeah, that told us <laughs> that first of all, Mike Smith got a lot of hardware. Oh wow, so yeah, he does. He has the right yeah. to say what he wants to say. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And, and he was well respected by every coach in, in 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 the state of Virginia, you know, whether you high school or college. When he told us that and didn't give us an explanation, we just kind of put two and two together because, like I said before, most of those kids on that all-star team are project kids or was from the projects at one point. No doubt. No. <laughs> you know, so we, oh, could yeah. put, we could put two and two together because Mike Smith knew how to relate to kids from the projects. So he knew how to put it in a way for you to understand it without him having to say it. So we come to find out later that, oh, he just didn't want to play for us. This ain't had nothing to do with Coach Carl or whoever the coach was in Michigan not allowing him to play. He just felt like he was better than Mike. He felt like he was better than uh, Curry. You know what I mean? Uh, me, all of us. And, and Coach Smith was like, that's okay. Because we're better. But I, on paper, it was impressive. But then when you got out there, it was like, where, where do you put a Ronald? Where do you put a Ronald Kerr and a Michael Vick on the field at the same time? Ha! This is how you do it. You put Vick at quarterback and you put Kerr at wide receiver. That's uh -huh. easy, easy. You know, hey, uh, uh, Ron Yell, you go play slot. So now you got, because I started in the backfield. So so I went from running back, and then when he went to go play these little piece, these little chess pieces or whatever, because he had them all. You know. It was like, whoa, I could play the slot? And now I'm running like a pro-style offense. I'm learning how to run a pro-style offense in the slot. I'm used to – I'm a back, you know what I mean? Oh, okay, now now we can put Curry at receiver, I mean, at quarterback. And now we're going to put uh, Mike at wide out, you know. It was so many pieces to play with, you know. And then things get too, things get too messy. We throw it to Bobby. We throw it to Big Blizzard over the top, you know. But, hey, let's not forget. As great as we were, and I'm gonna say this, and I don't mean no disrespect to anybody who played in the uh, Virginia High School League All Star Game. I this is just my personal opinion. I do feel like that was the greatest team I've ever saw, and, and, and I watched the Under Armour All Star Games. I watched all these other high school games, you know, All Star Games. I'm like, we would have ran them out of town. We would have ran them out of town. My homeboy, I got a homeboy uh, who. Uh, my homeboy, Tory Cox, that played at the University of Pittsburgh. And, you know, he yeah. out of Dade County. Yeah. You know, Central. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know what comes out of there. No doubt. And we get in, we used to get into the argument back and forth about who had the best all-star team. But then I used to have to tell them, like, I understand that the state of Florida and all you guys have so much talent. But if you flip that coin to the other side, you had a Lisa, a Willie Powell, a Jake Housewright, you know, like – you had some beasts on the other side too, you know, you know, and it was, it was more like if we don't win this game or we don't figure out how to win this game big, we're not going to get to just do a being like so-called one of the best high school teams that ever was assembled for an all-star game. And that was the mindset we went in because we knew that Willie Powell and all these other boys was coming to play. We knew who they were, you know, because all of us was going to basically the same school. The yes, G Tech sir. or UVA or whatever, you know. So you kind of knew each other at that point, and you know, and, and, and what you brought to the table as far as physical ability, you know, and just sure athleticism. So 
playing in that All-Star game was awesome, man. Mike Smith, was, it was my first opportunity to see how, okay, this kind of gave me just a little bit insight of how college may be, because that's the way he ran it. And it was no. awesome. Yeah, and, and, um, and now, like I said, I have pride because uh, we came in after Cornell Brown and Antonio Banks and Lawrence Lewis and all those guys. And then we came in, got our taste of humble pie, but we learned the work ethic that was required. And then you guys came in shortly thereafter behind Keon and those guys. And then it was almost like we were passing the torch and then y'all took it to another level. But before you get to Tech, before you chose to go to Virginia Tech and, and, and play with Mike and, and all those guys you mentioned, Willie Powell and Lee Suggs, you were at Lake Taylor. Was it a done deal? Were there other schools involved? I mean, was it cut and dry? Like, oh, when you got that call from Bima, you missed some other coaches, Bowden. How did it end up being Virginia Tech? This, this is like one of my favorite stories of all time. And my, 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 my grandmother loves when I tell this story. I, um, <laughs> so my sophomore year, as a freshman, Virginia Tech sent me a letter. Propaganda letter, not, nothing, nothing crazy, nothing about recruiting, you know, to say, hey, Virginia Tech is a great place. Like they would say any freshman, student, you know, they didn't, they didn't bring any laws or anything like that. It was just a simple letter saying, Virginia Tech is a great place to go to school. It had nothing to do with football in it, nothing. Because they knew you could not send a freshman, student athlete, any, any type of letter or even propaganda letter that has anything to do with football if they're, if they're an athlete. So it was just them just talking about the school, you know. Sophomore year, turn around, more interest. Now I'm able to get those letters that say, yeah. hey, we're interested, et cetera, et cetera. And Coach Steinspring, my, my, my right-hand man, you know, he was the one that was recruiting me. So me and him had built a relationship that was just off the top like this, you know. And my, my grandparents, they liked them. They didn't quite understand everything yet because they wasn't physically seeing or being able to talk to these coaches yet. So after that chance, when you were able to give your verbal, I gave my verbal as a sophomore. Really? I, I gave a verbal. Yep, Coach Nine Spring, any of those guys that could tell you, Coach Beamer, tell you, I gave my verbal as a sophomore. And Lou West was a great guy. You know, when I had a chance to talk to him, it was a, he was a great guy. And I was like, all right. Tonight is the night I'm going to do it. And they were at a party. They were having a coach's party. And it was Bud, Lou West, Stein Spring, Kavanaugh. Um, I can't remember who else was there, but Coach Stein Spring would tell me all the coaches who was there. They were just having a regular barbecue. Yeah, yeah, regular yeah. hangout as coaches, you know, wives and all that stuff. And he was like, well, uh, you got something to tell me? What, um, what's going on? I was like, Coach, I just want to let you know that verbally committing to Virginia Tech. And he turned and he told everybody else. And, and, and I'm I'm acting it out as if I was there. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but I just pictured him just being like, he's in. Kind of like I was booby mouths. I thought I was booby mouths, guys. <laughs> they went nuts in there. They went nuts. I was like, ooh, if you want to win, you got to let booby spin, baby. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they and they and they went they went absolutely nuts man. and I heard it on the phone and that gave a jolt of energy through my body where it made me forget about being in Young's Park and all these other places and just thinking that I'm just playing just to continue to play or having that doubt of I can't play with these particular people that's why I can't go from playing trying to play rep ball to high school because I don't think I'm good enough. When he did that and I heard those people back there screaming and yelling like somebody just got drafted, I knew that now I know I can play at this next level too because they believe in me. These people ain't just screaming because they don't believe in me. You know, that happens. Next thing you know, junior year comes, senior year comes, and now it's time for coaches to come and sit down and, and pitch you. So Coach Bowden comes to my grandparents' uh, house. We Bobby Bowden, right? The, the legendary Bobby Bowden, right? Yeah, Bobby, Bobby, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep, yep, yeah. You know, it's only a couple few Bobbies now. Bobby, Bobby Brown, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but when he came into my grandparents' place, 
and all of our meetings was always set up in my grandmother's living the the living room, the room where nobody can go in, nobody well, no can doubt. sit in. That's old. That's old school. See, kids yeah. don't know that my friends may not even know it. Like, it, wait, depending on where you grow up, grandma had a room. You ain't going. My mama had a room. You ain't sit down. You ain't play cards there. Nah. <laughs> yeah, the den. Yeah, the den and all that other stuff for that. That particular room was for like. Uh, preachers, preachers, if they insurance, came out, insurance yeah. people, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, coach come to talk to you, a principal come to talk to you. That room yeah. is for that. You know what I mean? You know, so Coach Bowden comes to the house, and and you know, my grandparents, we we, you know, barbecue, and we cooking out, you know, and uh, and that's that's what we had. That's what we had that day. He pitched them, and my grandmother didn't. She didn't really like it because you know he got that 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 southern draw. But she was like, "It's some behind him that I really didn't." She really wasn't comfortable with, which was fine, you know. But then we get Coach Schneider comes, you know, uh, K State comes in. She loved him. She loved him. You know, he had old school type, you know, mentality. A lot like Beamer. He's a lot like Beamer. Yeah. Bingo, bingo. Yeah, so I think that's. I think that's what warmed her up for the next person who's about to come through there. But this is how I know she liked Coach Beamer and Virginia Tech more than the mother schools. We cooked out for uh, Coach Bowden. I think my grandmother did like a, a – I can't remember what it was she did for uh, Coach Snyder, but it, it wasn't nothing big. Coach Beamer and, and Coach Steinspring comes to sit down in my grandparents' living room. We had mac and cheese, some other pork chops, collard greens, cornbread, peach cobbler. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, we she had it all. She she actually went into the kitchen to cook. She, <laughs> she wanted she wanted to impress these you know these coaches. And Coach Beamer just sat down and 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 this what this was sold her. Coach Beamer sat down, smooth as the other side of the pillow, cool, calm, and collect. She said. What is your school gonna be able to do for my grandson? Coach Beamer say, because she asked that to both coaches. Now I don't know the mindset that Bobby Bowen went into when she asked that. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and we can take that how we want to take it. You know? No, I know. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but she was asking a legit question because she knew that I don't want him. He we, he came from the projects. We didn't. We we molded him into something different. He's not that anymore. Mm -hmm. So Coach Beamer said, well, I can promise you these things. Three things that he will do. One, he will graduate. Two, every year he will have the opportunity to play for a national title. And three, when he leaves Virginia Tech, he will be a better man than he was when he first stepped onto campus. At the first one, my grandmother was sold. He will graduate. Every year he had opportunity to play for the national title. Me and my granddad was hyped for that one. We was hyped for that one. <laughs> which you did, which you did. Which I did. Yeah. And, 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 and this what put the exclamation point where my grandmother was sold. He will leave a better man. That's all she wanted to hear. That's all, all mothers want to hear. They want to make sure that these, these young men leave as young men, but they come back as, as men and be ready for whatever the world is ready to present to them. And, and from there, that was it. And she told me when they left, she said, Ron, Virginia Tech is the school for you. And I was like, Grandma, I want to take my other visits. Now, this is where things get a little tricky, big fella. So I take my visits. I call Coach Steinspring. Now, understand, this is senior year. I verbally committed two years before that. So I called Coach Steinspring. It was, a hard, it was one of the hardest conversations I had to have with him. I said, Coach, I'm going to take my visits. Oh, come on, Ron. You take your visits for what? You, you already, you know, <laughs> got these visits. I'm going to take them. I know, them. I know how Stanley said. I can hear him I now. I got these visits, so I'm going to take them. And, and, and I'm not going to get into the Virginia Tech visit, uh, visit. We'll get into that later or whatever. Mm -hmm. But when I took my visit, I was like, all right. He was like, what's the first school you going to? UVA. He was like, what? Like, he was, he, he was upset. But I said, coach, I got to get him out the way. Because they're in state. No doubt. I got to show respect to, to UVA and Virginia Tech. You know what I mean? You know, I grew up wearing the UVA shirts when I was seven, eight years old. I said, Coach, I'm going to take the visit. Took the visit. My host, Aaron Brooks and Anthony Poindustin. I said, oh, Lord. Woo! 
Ooh. Your people, your cousins. Yeah, they hit you. They hit you with some some heavy hitters. Yep. Especially yep. AP. AP yep. one of the yep. best safeties ever do it. Yep. Point yep. So 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 we had Anthony Point Dexter and uh, Aaron Brooks, both of them. You know, and he was like, "Yeah, man, you know, blah blah blah." You know, and I got a little cousin that played down there. You know, and I'm like, "Oh, I know who he is." You know, that was my first visit. My second visit, K State. They were like, you know, we gotta we gotta recruit. You know, we got a a, a host for you. And I think the host, mom, that got uh, my host that was supposed to be my host got sick. So they were like, "We're gonna put you with one of our freshmen." Terrence Newman, bam, there it is. You know, but he won't tee new yet, though. No, I know, but I'm just thinking about what he became. Yeah, you know. So, so, but he was trying to pitch me as you come here, you can play corner. Both of us can play corner together. And I'm like, oh, okay, oh, okay, I see what they're doing with that. NC State. The only reason I took that visit because they wanted to play me as a true freshman at running back. And, and even to this day, my best friend Alvin. And some of my boys still mad that I didn't make that decision because everybody thought I was a great back. You were a good back. You were. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, you I were. appreciate it, big fellow. So then my fourth visit, I was like, all right, might as well. Might as well. Michigan. Host, after they just won the title a year ago, Mr. Woodson himself. So I'm like, Woodson? I'm some Woodson. Yep. Yep. <laughs> but the thing was, my grandmother was like, okay, you took these visits. I didn't think you should have took any of them. And of course, I know her, her and Steiny. I know her and Cole Stein Spring was talking with each other. I know they were. I know, because even to this day, they still do it. Even to this day, they, you know, they get into a chit chat every now and then. Cole Stein Spring is no, tell them I say, hey, you know. But, uh, but, but that's the beauty of Virginia Tech because those relationships then still last now. Yeah, you know what? Let me touch on something. You're 100 percent right because. Coach Steinspring will call and check on me now. Yes. Um, you know what I'm saying? Text me, uh, you know, Coach Height, who was my recruiter, and he then he went back to recruiting the DMV, the math of Maryland area where he was from. Uh, he, he got him some victory life gear, you know, um, and he still checks in, you know, comes on Facebook, you, you on there, and all those guys. But another point I want to touch on, what's amazing about – that time and where we're from, and I don't think Bema, Sign Spring, and Kavanaugh and the coaches at Tech get it enough credit, I should say. Let me clarify, get enough credit and respect. It is very difficult, especially in the NCAA, where most college coaches, and this needs to change and improve, are white males. Mm -hmm. And it's very, and they're not, obviously, we love those guys. We know them. They're not racist. It's not about the that. It's more so about to get guys to buy in from areas in the 757 in Richmond, to leave an area in Norfolk, Chesapeake, Hampton, Richmond, Newport News, even Williamsburg, which is more suburban-like, but to leave those areas where we see what we saw and then go to Southwest Virginia for four to five years, three years, and to buy in, not just on the field, that's easy, but in the community socially, in Southwest Virginia, and I know it's the same thing for you and D'Angelo Hall and Sharon, most of us had never been there. I didn't even know, I had never, I never heard of Bon and Tot and all that, Floyd County and Radford. And I just feel like when you get guys to buy in from Eastern Newport News and Norfolk and, and Suffolk and all those places to come there, Virginia Beach, and make that your home and fall in love with it. And to get guys to buy in is very impressive because, you know, like you, when I was being recruited, it was nothing to be hype about going on a visit if it was Georgia Tech, you know, Hot Atlanta, you know, Atlanta. I mean, we already know about the Canes, Miami, South Beach. But to basically the guys before me and the guys after myself, you and everyone, even guys after you to make and put Blacksburg on the map, because we bought in and for Beamer to go in neighborhoods and I tell people, man, you know, they ask, yeah, Star Spring and Cav and Beamer, they went into neighborhoods that other guys of their of their race did not go in. And I mean they went in, you know, and they went in comfortable. But you know, I mean, I'm from down there and I know when and where and why. You, you know, you know when you can go somewhere. And they did. I just I just wanted to touch on that because I think that gets lost sometimes because it's expected or recruit this kid. And another thing is even though UVA at that time was still the premier program, we were taking over their spot. What's even more uh, impressive is that 
uh, there are a lot of guys from where you're from and where we're from that schools wouldn't take because of where we're from. Bingo. Yeah. People are like that. And that's how people don't realize, oh, they're talented. Now, there's some guys that won't touch kids because they, they're labeled. And um, I think that got lost, too. It you did. Know? It did. And, 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 that's, and, and that's one of the things where, where I, that's also a thing where I felt like I was blessed because I look at it this way. I think if I was, if I was in Bobby Bowden's backyard in the projects, he come see me. If I'm in the projects in the state of Virginia, he's not coming to see me in Young's Park. Steiny and Beamer will. Yes. They will, yes. they will be in that housing project to find out exactly who this kid is and, 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 and how do we get them to come to our school. It, it, was the three, it was three things that Coach Beamer said that impressed the three people in the room, and it was, it was a wrap. It was a wrap, you know, and, and I, you know what, and as far as me coming to Virginia Tech and on, and, and is this something I can harp on right now? Or as far as my, my visit to Tech? Yes. Yeah. We, yeah. You go ahead. Yeah. Because I saved that one for last. <laughs> I saved that one for last because I knew that because I took the other four visits, they were going to be like, oh, oh, we rolling it out. So this is how my fifth visit at Virginia Tech goes. So we played a basketball game that night, and I believe it was either by, against Booger T or Maury or whatever. And uh, and we played the game or whatever, and I was heading to the airport. And we were flying out of Newport News because we had to pick up Mike. Come to find out Mike and them had a game that same night too. So we were being done just about the same time. And uh, so we get on the plane, and it was this other cat that was uh, that was um, that we had to pick up, or we were, yeah, that we had to pick up or whatever. And I believe his last name was like Rogers or whatever. He was like an old lineman or whatever, and he was huge into UVA. You know, I remember him. Yeah, and, it was and, a little bit different. Yeah, because he he, <laughs> he, had, he, had, he made a laugh one time at the uh, Artemis Bar, uh, uh, Artem Bean, the place that we ate or whatever. Uh, uh, that with the states that we used to go for like Friday night. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we were talking one time at the table. He he just came out with this laugh. And I remember <laughs> on the whole table looked and we, we couldn't believe it. But it was awesome because when we got to Virginia Tech, we met you was Mike's host and Sharon was my host. And y'all was already boys. And yes. I, rem I remember telling Mike on the way there, because I was like, man, you know who your host gonna be? He was like, oh no, I think it's gonna be my cousin. I was like, oh, okay, all right, you know. I was like, man, I wonder who mine gonna be, you know. And then when I found out it was Sharon Stiff, I was like, oh, 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 because I was a fan. I, I, I was a fan, you know what I mean? I knew what he did. I knew what he did at Western Branch, you, you know what I mean? You know, so we get there and we hang out. You guys showed us a great time. But the one thing that I would never take away from my visit at Virginia Tech is I watched the way that people, students, students interacted with you and Sharon was different how I saw them, how they would just interact, interacting with other people. And, 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 and I, I think it was some bit of your, your gas, your, your cachet, you know what I mean? Yeah, and and sure. as far as what you did on the field and all that other stuff. But just watching, watching y'all too, you know, if y'all took us to like a Shawnee party or something like that, you know, a Squires party that weekend or whatever, just watching the way y'all rolled through and how y'all carried yourself, it was, it, I wouldn't say it was business like, it was grown man type. It, it was real grown, you know. And, 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 you know, you got two kids, you know, men, ooh, coming in, you know, on the college campus just so excited, you know. We like, man, look how these boys roll. You, you know what I mean? Like, what y'all want to do? Y'all want to go here? Y'all want to, you know? And it, 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 was, it was the best out of all the visits I had. And this is not blowing smoke whatsoever. You can ask my homeboys. You can ask my mom, my grandma. You can ask my wife. They always, I tell them every time it was the best visit I ever had because nothing, not, it, it was just a regular weekend. It felt like a regular weekend down in the 757 with my boys. And, and, and it was awesome, man. It was awesome. And and being able to see the facilities, meeting Mike Gentry, understanding who a Coach Height is, you know, personality-wise, you know. <laughs> coach Height would roast you. Coach Height roast you. 
<laughs> yeah, 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 you know, you. Yeah, he, understanding he, yeah. what the split toe cigarette thing was, you know, it was a, uh, uh, it, it was just, it was just something that was different, and it felt like, it felt like home, big fella. It felt well, like you know, I was able to get there, and I was with you guys who, who were our hosts, and I was like, it's, it felt like I'm just kicking it back at home with the fellas. And T, wasn't TP Terrell Palm on there too that TP, weekend? TP was there. Yes. TP was there. It was, it was uh, it was a, it was a couple. I think Anthony Davis was there too. He was, he was. Yep. But you, know, but, but here's the thing. What I remember about that visit, because you're right, that was a great. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it hanging out, and I remember um. You guys, at that time, I lived in Collegiate Suites, and we were all in um, in my living room. We had the music playing, you know, back then, Wu-Tang, Nas, you just tapes and CDs playing, and we were on the sticks and, you know, talking and chopping up, but I remember seeing the chemistry, and I remember, I don't know if you remember, because there's some things we can't share on this show, <laughs> um, but, but, you, Mike, TP, and a few other guys there were already foreshadowing what later happened in the 99 season when y'all eventually played Florida State for a national championship. And I remember sitting there looking and listening and also doing my thing, um, listening to the, the chemistry develop between you, Mike, and TP, and everybody that was there at my place talking about, yo, we come here, we can do this. You know, we can we can we can beat the Canes, we can beat UVA if we got him and y'all were talking about and if Suggs come I mean it was like the energy yep, yeah. and it, you guys ended up being right. Did you so did you know when you got there when when everyone committed and you finally signed the, the uh, national uh, letter of intent, whatever, did you know when you got there from jump that you guys were gonna change and take it to a next level? Or I'm gonna be was, honest with I'm gonna be honest with you. I did, and, and, and I'm, and I'm going to just say it from this perspective, from being a, a naive 19-year-old that watched the program on loop. Oh, yeah. I thought to myself, with this class, if we all can come together with this particular class of people that I know that already committed from, you know, from the Willie Powell's, the, you know, I'm thinking, like, we, we could put it together. We got a Latimer and, and, and uh, uh, um, and um, uh, uh, house right, H house right. We got a Latimer. Yeah. You know what I mean. We got a safety <laughs> and Willie Powell. You know what I mean. I'm gonna play corner. You know, we, we got Marlon Hits that's gonna that's gonna claw at the middle. Like I'm saying, uh, we got an Emmett Johnson. You know what I mean. Like I know he only played a year, but if you can play a year and get a scholarship, he gotta be good. You, you know what I mean. Like you know, I'm, I'm just thinking about all this. Terrell Parham just slasher. So dynamic from Bartow, Florida. You know, he gonna remind you that eight million times. You know what I mean. You know, he he was just a he was just a a, a different cat when he got the ball because his idol was Peter Ward. So he had the dead leg and all this stuff at an early age, you know. But I knew in my heart of hearts that we couldn't do it if we didn't have Mike. Like I knew that. I, I knew that. You know what I mean? And I didn't I didn't know a lot of the quarterbacks at Virginia Tech at that time. Mike probably did because when you following a team, you know the guys that play your position. You know what I mean? So I knew about Torian Gray, and Antonio Banks, and all these guys. I knew about them because because that's who I studied. You know. But I remember getting back on the plane on the way back home, and we were talking about our visit. We were so hyped, you know. And uh, old boy was sitting in the back, you know, and he was just quiet. And for some reason, we we didn't connect with him. But I think he had already had his mindset for something else because he ended up going to UVA, of course. You know, and God bless his soul. You know, but. I kept telling Mike, and I'm pitching him, I'm pitching him like, like, like I'm an agent. So I'm sitting like this on the, and I'm like, look, man, look, <laughs> come here, man. Like we can do this, we can do this, we can do all this stuff. We could be roommates, you know what I mean? Like, like I'm, I'm, I'm pitching him like we step brothers, the movie, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I'm like, look, man, it's, it's so much we can do, man. Like, you know, like you, you know what? You ain't even got to worry about Ronald Curry no more. You won't. You won't even have to worry about being in his shadow or nothing. Well, you know what? It's interesting because not, I go. I go back to something real quick. I don't know if Anthony Davis was on that visit. I, I don't know if he. I was don't there. think so either. Now that I think about it, yep. I think he came a year later. But I will say this: between you and me, I think those conversations really helped Mike make up his mind. Because while you were telling him that, I was telling him about 
Al was getting ready to leave, obviously we were, um, you know, heading to our last year and we, he could take Bustle's offense to the next level. And I remember, um, you might not know this, but, um, you know, you call assist my wife, Shanice, my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, they were in, um, this is before the spring game became the event that it is now at Tech. You could come down there now back then and grab a seat. You could jump on the field. You know, so it wasn't packed, but y'all, it was raining that day. We had a uh, scrimmage, and you, her, my man, tall Aaron, you know Aaron. Aaron, yep. Y'all were all in there watching a scrimmage. And I remember what I found unique is everyone that knows you well knows you're, you're hilarious, you're funny. They were showing, um, not showing, you were watching us play. And you were like, what you going to do right here, Mike? You were playing, and he, and he was like, ah, uh, you were like, and sack. You're not ready. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> you know what? What's interesting is that kind of relationship you had with him, the fact that you were real with him, because even then I could tell as Mike was coming along that everyone wasn't that comfortable around. Some people will get around people that are iconic and they get uncomfortable. You remained yourself. You recruited him. You joke with him about that, but then you came back after you said it because Shanice and Aaron told me about how you were like, nah, man, for real, though. You see what we're doing right here, the option, and you were talking, you were asking and stuff, then you were looking at the people playing your position, you know, the LJs and everybody like that. And it was amazing to see it come, come to fruition. You know, I remember when you, Mike, and him and all y'all got there, coming over there, if you, I don't know if you remember me and Shanice would bring y'all dinners and food. Yes! 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 <laughs> I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that. Hell uh, yeah! But see, that's what I mean. That's what I mean, how y'all carried yourselves differently. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, we were, I guess, looking back, you're right, we were, because we were old and we had done a lot of this stuff, but I think it was the family, like you said, this is home atmosphere, the importance of paying it forward to looking out after our, our young brothers and sisters coming in because it's important. But I also took that when y'all was doing that stuff, I knew, we knew y'all was checking up on us, you know, but at the same time, it was a way of y'all saying without saying it, don't F this up. Oh, no question. No people from our area don't get a lot of opportunities. <laughs> don't F this up. But y'all no just question. didn't say it. You just said it in a different way. You know no. what I mean? You know. Yeah, yeah. So, now let's talk about because... Hold up, hold up. Before you get into this, let me say my favorite line that I always tell people. Go I ahead. always say, look, I help, I help seal the deal with number seven, but I'm going to tell you now, there's no seven without five seven. Now you put that 757 together on your ass. <laughs> Think about that one. Think about that one. I need to put that on a bumper sticker. Yeah, no question. You know what's crazy, man? Um, you know, I don't, I'm not on no documentaries, man. I know I have a I have a, a platform. I'm very well known and respected. I know a lot of people check for me and respect me. But it's always funny when I sit back and watch shows, like when I saw Don the McNair time, I thought I had Mike and this down, whatever. People don't realize, man, like. Everything's about the domino effect or the connections involved relationships because if I don't choose Tech, I was the first um, player from my high school to commit to Virginia Tech since 1985. I came out in 94. If I don't go there, then do you get Mike? You know, and then when I recruited him, people don't realize, man, I was calling him all the time, number one, because he was fan, but I was like really recruiting him mm -hmm. because I saw what he could do in our offense. And I felt like the other thing was I was hitting with him with the angle of you come here and Ron go to UVA, that might be the best rivalry in the history of football because they were just so dynamic. And, you know, it worked out for Mike. It worked out for Ron too, but I always felt yeah. that if he went to UVA, he would have really been the Ron we knew in high school. Yeah, and, but, but, on a, but on another note too, we would have rolled his ass then too. <laughs> <laughs> What's funny, Mike told me y'all would check in and call Ron when y'all yeah. first got the tech and be like, yo, Ron, you don't want to see us. You don't want to see us. Yeah. Nope. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and, and it was all love. And it was all love. But and, and, and you know, I love you know, I love Ron C and all that, but I'm gonna tell you right now. He go to UVA, we roll their ass still. <laughs> Book it. Book it. <laughs> No doubt, no doubt, no doubt. Hey, the state, of, the state of Virginia would have been on fire. You know what would have been like to get the, the final ticket in those stadiums? If you knew every year you get Ron Kerr and Michael Vick head to head? Oh, my God. 
Yeah, you know, um, I, I always said when I did radio shows and segments that I felt like by them not getting run, it set them back. They got they got my man Biscuit, but he mm -hmm. you know he, he played quarterback late in his career, but he was a receiver at first. They had Grow, um, Aaron, but but they were before Ron. Um, but if Ron comes and does what he does, I think you keep it going with UVA's quarterbacks and their, their you know their, their success. But then when they didn't get him, it was tough because you know Jamil Sewell and those other guys that came, they just weren't what Ron could have been in that offense, man. But yep, yep. Tech. But, but go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just had to say that. <laughs> no, nah, but back to you at Tech. So in 99, y'all make a run. I want to get to the I, – I, I just find it amazing is that it, it happened like almost scripted like you knew it would based on our conversations, what I saw coming back. But also the fact that I remember sitting there with my wife uh, and we were in the Superdome, New Orleans, and going to the fourth quarter, it was 29-28. You know, Mike said on my show that, you know, after the game, y'all was sick. Y'all cried. It hurt, you know. Oh and God. you were a young kid. And mm -hmm. you got in the game. You're going against, to me, one of the best collegiate football players of all time in Peter Ward. And I know you won't shut because that ain't never been you. Take me back to 99. The season, that game, y'all mindset. What, what was it like? 99 was awesome. I'm going to be honest with you. 99 was, 99 was awesome. But... But in order for me to talk about 99, I got to talk about the 98 team. Because when I saw how they worked, when I saw how they worked in the weight room, when I saw the way they, the way they hung out with each other, when I saw the way they had uh, 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 debate battles, East Coast, West Coast, Pop, Biggie, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> if, I you, if I get into a one more East Coast, West Coast uh, conversation with a Florida boy, I'm, I'm, I'm going to kill myself. But... <laughs> and I love all my Florida brothers. Florida I love them boys, man, we love y'all, man. But you know, love back there, I love them, man. I love them. Uh, but oh, Lord, but the mercy. thing about it was, is <laughs> when I saw that, and I and I understood how the work ethic was, and then we get into and um, we get into the spring game, and I saw the stuff that we was able to accomplish in the spring game as true freshmen. And Mike went in the offensive one, and I went in the defensive one, and it, it was almost like a thing where. We got back to the room with our plaques. We got back to uh, the dorm. We were like, both of us, you the player this year, I'm the player, you know, offensive defense. And we were roommates, you know. And it was almost like you could see it. Here it is. It's bubbling up just a little bit. Things are kind of stepping into play. And then we go and blow out Alabama in the Music City Bowl. You, you, you know what I mean? And, and that was somewhere I was thinking to myself. And, and, and that Alabama team – wasn't like Alabama is now, but that was still Alabama. I don't, I don't, I don't give a damn what year you talk about. They no still question. had Sean Alexander and all the crew. You, you know yeah, what I mean? Fernando Bryant, Chris Samuels. Yes. Yeah, they it were was nice. They, they still had a team, you know. And I remember showing up to Nashville, Tennessee, and it was like ice and all that. And Coach Beamer just telling us to just kick the ice out the way and, you know, practice is going to be fine and this and that. And you boys go in there and roll them and, and – and, and the block kicks and the key on the picks and and the Al clocks runs and the and the the, the uh, Ricky Hall catch it, it it was a thing you know the Gilder sleeves the you know it was it was so many guys where I was just like it don't matter what your size is no matter how short you are no matter how if you're fast you're slow you're big you're fat you're tall you're, no matter what it is you it, we have a role for you to play and these guys were put in roles and they were successful. And I knew from their point what we had to do for our class because we were so highly touted, especially with the all-star game and all that stuff. What so many players coming off that going to Blacksburg was we had to buy in. And if you didn't buy in, it was one guy on that coaching staff was gonna make sure you bought in whether you wanted to. And if you didn't, you go on and play somebody play somewhere else. His name was Mike Gentry. Yes, sir. If you buy into this, then it was easy when you got on the field. Bruh, listen, I remember when you, Emmett, and Mike, and TP were over in the weight room, I was back in town helping Coach Gentry out coach prepare that yep. year. Yep. And I came back because I was, you know, still trying to train and get back in the league. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about holding everybody accountable. Y'all mm -hmm. was over there arguing about Norfolk, Chesapeake, Newport News, music, 
And I keep looking, and I came over there and said, hey, guys, man, Gentry, y'all get to work. He's looking at you. Yup, yup, yup. <laughs> y'all at the squat bar. All of a sudden, y'all arguing. Mike and them ain't paying attention. You know, anyone that lift weights, I don't care if you play ball or not, you, you, you take the weights off at the same time. Y'all yep. taking them off at one time. The weight thing popped. <laughs> the ball pops up and hits the wall. And, you know, this is during workout, so it's other players in there. Gentry, <laughs> turn the music down. Get the hell out of my weight room now. <laughs> yep. And I'm yep. looking. Yep. And, I, and, you yep. know, that's a funny story. But I, I share that story because, you know, y'all ran like y'all dad was yelling at y'all. Like, you know, and you, you talking about Ryan, mm -hmm. You, you know, Emmett, TP, and Mike. Y'all the next up, and y'all projected starters and key contributors, and Gentry didn't care. So you're right, Gentry didn't care. Now, later on, we laughed about it, but at that time, I remember I came in there, you know, y'all were getting in the showers, and you are like, what'd he say? What'd he say? <laughs> yup, yup, yup. <laughs> I just said none. He just told me to tell y'all to stop, you know, stay focused, whatever, whatever. I mean, I don't know how it is now, not just at Tech, but other schools, but that kind of accountability, I think you're right, really made sure y'all stayed on point, you know? And, 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 and that was a thing, and, and, and you know this, that was just the weight room. Forget about if, if, if you're not paying attention when you get around your coaches, you know, this was just the weight room, you, you, you know what I mean? But, but that, was, that was also that, that, that hard nose, because when that music went down, when, when first when the bar flipped, I never forget it. We were over there just talking nonsense, and that bar flipped and hit that wall. Man, my heart dropped, and it, cause you had just told us, you had just came over there to hey fellas, y'all make sure y'all get to work, man. Coach G kind of looking over there at y'all, man. You know, because that was our little click. That was our little click right there. You know what I mean? And and that's they know that happened, and we were like, and I wish I wish I could have took a snapshot of your face. When we look back, because you were just like, I just told y'all. I just told y'all. You know what I mean? <laughs> he turned that music down. Because I remember when he turned the music down, TP tried to go grab a uh, like one of the little juices from the joint. He was like, no, get out. <laughs> <We> just, <laughs> you know the little after workout juices? Or yeah. Gator loads. Some milk. We call it gator loads. Gator loads. They were like the fake Gatorade. You yeah. Know, like, Tech, you know, tech won't tech then. It was still on the come up. So we had that little, it was gator load. I was like, what is a gator load, bro? When we coming down there, you know, the refrigerator was over here. Yeah. When you go to that door and the, and the exit door is going out that way. Man, we going to walk all of a sudden, TP. I said, get out. TP just came on back. <laughs> but, but it was, but we are bought in. We are bought in. We are bought in with the class of people before us. And seeing how they work at the, and how and how, and don't no matter what the rings look like, when you got a ring, you got a ring. So when y'all got that ring, we were like, we gotta get us a ring, man. We we gotta get one of these. You know, no like, we gotta say that we help get one of these. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so going into that, going into that national championship season, it was like we we didn't know it was it was it was almost like the unknown. You you know what I mean? Like I felt. I felt pressure, but I didn't feel as much pressure as like Mike and Emmett and Jake, you know, because those guys was able to play as true freshmen, you know, and, and, and what, when people, what, what people don't understand is as great as Mike was, it was a guy named Dave Meyer that they was, <laughs> they was, they was he was ahead of Mike. America, I don't know if you know this, America, but <laughs> this guy named Dave Murray. You can Google him, and I love Dave. Dave, my guy. Oh, Dave's Dave a great dude. Great dude. Great dude. Great dude. Great dude. Dave is so calculated and so just so precise on where things has got to be. And Mike is more of a control recklessness, like yeah, as Coach yeah. Beamer was Coach saying. Coach Beamer said control recklessness. <laughs> control recklessness. You know what I mean? So, so. What people don't understand is like might had to might had to get that job, might had to fight for that job. I mean, yeah, it only took two weeks, but might had to <laughs> 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 it only took two weeks, but he had to fight for that job. But when he got in, we knew that okay, let's see how this thing gonna turn out. Rutgers come to town, blow him out. You know, a uh, 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 temple. We we you know we we go at the temple. 
you know, blow them out or whatever. And then that's thing, you know, it's so many, it's so many things where that's happening where now I'm not, I don't have to go in and have as much pressure as somebody like Mike, because now he's the guy. You know, I'm playing behind Anthony Midget, you know, Lauren Johnson, you know, Ike Charlton. Like I'm playing, I'm playing behind some some hitters, you know. Well, well, not Lauren. Sorry, Lauren was the year before. But like Ike Charlton, Anthony Midget, and those guys, you know, and, and trying to have an understanding that like shit, only person I can really talk to to try to get an understanding without losing my mind is LA. So me and LA, that's how me and Larry Austin got so tight. Cause we were like, look, when it's our turn to go in, man, we gotta be ready. You know what yeah. I mean? Cause Lou, Lou had left, you know. So it was a situation where it was like we was working with Lorenzo Ward, with uh, Whammy Ward, you know. Whammy, and he Whammy. was all about, yeah, he was all about young players playing. I'm gonna play these young players, and you're gonna you're gonna get your feet wet, you know, very early, and whatever happens, we figure it out. So when we go into that, it it that is another thing that forced me to grow up too was you know as far as football but because when I was a freshman I was understanding like hold up who is these guys I'm going who is an Antonio Bryant who is a Latif Grimm who you know who, who are these receivers I'm like these guys are studs you know but then once you get in there understand that okay I'm playing behind two studs you know Anthony Midget and Ike Charlton that I could kind of <sighs> Mike didn't have it Mike didn't have it Mike had to get in, and he had to get in and lead us to a national title. So fast forward through all that, you know, those games and, and understanding that, oh, I got to go against a Santana Moss on this day, uh, a Latif Grimm on this day, you know, and, and and have a full understanding that I have I have to grow because we're about to do something big at the end. And that's what we did. And like Coach Beamer said, go one and know every week, and those things will take care of themselves. This is the Frank Beamer hand, by the way. And, yeah. you know, those things will take care of themselves. <laughs> Just take care of our business, and these things will take care of themselves, you know. And he was right. And he was right. He was, and then that's thing you know. And then that's thing you know, we're playing in the title game. And Coach Ward comes to me the night before the game. He was like, you know, just want to let you know that, you know, you're going to have to be ready, you know. Uh, Cause I think Ike was dealing with a little, you know, a little tweak here and there. Yeah, Midget was a little growing, you know. And, and and Midget and Ike, shit, they put their arms around us and talked to me in LA and, and let us know that look, man, y'all got to be ready. You know what I mean? You know. And this is the biggest stage. Next thing you know, get in the game, first play, it's me and Peter Ward. Now, America, if you don't understand this, <laughs> and I'm gonna let you know about this on Victory Life. There's two things, boy, Foster like to do. All right, <laughs> blitz off the bus and play man-to-man -man coverage. <laughs> and if you can't stand up, you can't play for him because he's gonna blitz and he's gonna blitz and he's gonna blitz you until he can't blitz you no more. So you have to understand that you're gonna be in a lot of single-man coverage and it's time for your young high pots to grow up. You know what I mean? So it took for me to grow up and, and when he caught that one ball on me, I was like, ah, I just panicked. I'm be honest, I panicked because I knew who he was. You hit his, hit his arm. arm. Yep. Yeah. Because I knew who he was. He just he just won the Heisman. I I, I I knew who this cat was. I was like, I, I just sure out panicked. And then as time went on or whatever, the game going, I started to get a little comfortable. But I remember Peter Ward telling me this at the half. It ain't over. It ain't over, young fellow. It ain't over. And I just looked at him and only words that I was able to muster out of my mouth because I was I was starstruck, you know. I was like, "We ain't going nowhere," and that was it. And I just, I just I <laughs> but but then getting into that locker room and and, and talking to the and, and having some of those older guys kind of put their arm around me, the Engelbergers, the the Corey Moores, the Jamels, the Ricky Halls, you know, a lot of those guys were like, "Look, calm down." You know what I mean? You know, no, like calm down. You know, this, this other young guy too. You know, he was a, a year ahead of me or two years ahead of me. But a, a guy named Ben Taylor was like, just calm down, young young fella, calm down. You know, and that's what kind of gave me a little bit more. You know, it kind of helped my mojo a little bit going into that the rest of that game. But you know, doing that, we all looked at each other, especially the guys from that '98 class or whatever. We looked at each other and we said. We'll be back. If we do it all the right way, we'll we'll be back. But still, I'm gonna say this to this day. And people in my class can be upset. You can say what you want to say. I'm okay with that. 
from day one, I knew the plan for us to win a national title as far as my class was concerned and all those stars that came in was, like I said at the beginning of the conversation of this topic, we needed seven in order to do that. It was just like on a plane ride, going back home from the recruitment. If we can get seven, we can do all this stuff that we, That's and we had it. And then when he took that high ankle injury, you know, things started to kind of, and I was like, damn it. But, but he, he was the key piece. And we all was pieces. We all were great pieces, you know, in this puzzle. For but sure. He was that one, he's that one piece where you're like, I have no idea where this piece goes, but it goes somewhere. And it's always that one spot that helps the, all the other pieces kind of build the whole portrait. I think, I think there's nothing wrong with that. And if somebody in your class or during that time frame is doesn't want to hear it, they're not, they're not looking at it from the team concept of having an important player, like somebody that makes it all go. That high ankle sprain hurt him. I know Mike didn't care about the Heisman, but I think big picture, you're right, because it was y'all in Miami, and there was that big showdown in the Orange Bowl, and it was two versus three, and yep. Mike tried to go, and he couldn't go. I remember he grabbed his ankle on the option, and I think they beat y'all 41 to 21, if I remember, or something like that, but it yep. wasn't so much a blowout. It was just the momentum went away, and y'all also had a great season. Y'all still went 11 and one to beat Clemson in the Orange Bowl. You know, y'all yep. smashed them, and they had a good team that year. I think Woody Dantzler was there. Woody Dantzler, yeah. yeah but y'all smashed yep. him. Yep. But because my my assignment was Rod Gardner. And, yeah, and, the big and, receiver and, under the Redskins. <laughs> yes, and, and this one is for you, Andre Kendrick. We go out the first night there, right? First night we in town, we go out, and Andre and Kendrick, because everybody knew that uh, Coach Ward. My my one on one assignment was against Rod Gardner, and we go out the first night, just some little, some little small little bar, or whatever. And Andre Kendrick pulls me over and say, "Look, you see that guy right there? Because they were playing pool." He was like, "That's your guy right there. That's your assignment." And I looked at him, and I saw all six four, all six four, <laughs> two twenty, and he had a muscle shirt on. Andre Kendrick came. He he would tell you that this is a true story. He had a he had a muscle shirt on, and I'm talking about he was built like Adonis, like like the statue of David. You know, just built. I never went out after that night. And, and Dre Kendrick, all of them used to give me crap, like you going out, you, you going out tonight? Nope, 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 nope. All I did was sit in there and I studied the film, studied the film, studied the film. And that's how I ended up shutting down, I had two picks and all this other stuff, you know. But if once again, somebody that was already into the mentality of what Virginia Tech was all about and helping young fellas understand, like no different than you and Shanice at the time bringing food, saying it without saying it. Young fella, you out here, that's the best, that's the best player on their team other than the quarterback. What you going to do? And, and after that, I took that as him saying, you better get those together before this boy come out here and do his thing sure. against you. Sure, And yeah. that was it, without actually saying it. And that, but that was the Virginia, that was the hokey mindset. That was the, the 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 older guys bringing these young guys that let them understand that look, you ain't just here just just to be mediocre. You come here, we come here to kick people teeth in. We talk with our face. You know what I mean? <laughs> so so that that's one of the things where after that game, that's when I started to, to mentally create this this alter ego named Deuce. And and that's how that's how I ended up. As my man Antonio Brown, I mean Antonio, uh, I can't believe I said his name. Antonio Bryant always <laughs> told me, playing against Ron Yell Whitaker, man, is like playing against a superhero. When you see him off, off the field, he's the best guy ever. When you see him on, it's like something else is different. But I yeah. learned that from guys who came before me. I learned that from the Keon Carpenters. I learned that from those guys, you, you know, on how to turn this switch. It just so happened I wore number two. And then that's when I was just like, man. And then Andre Kendrick was the one who gave me that name and started calling me Deuce. Deuce, 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 and they ran from there. And that's how we started getting into, like, DBU and all that. DBU, and then you became uh, the best trash talker in the Big East. Uh, deuce, I came back. You know, this is towards your end of your career. You're getting ready to go to the league. And I remember sitting there with, with my wife and a few friends, and I saw a group of these kids that look like they should major in architecture, but these are Virginia Tech Hokie Nation fans wearing Whitaker Warriors shirts, yelling your name, chanting your name, 
And I said, Ryan, Ryan Yellen took over this damn university. <laughs> I you still know? got a wonderful warrior shirt now. My yeah, wife man. got it back there somewhere. <laughs> and it was amazing, but it was also humbling for me because, you know, I was just happy. I'm, I'm one of those people that I'm happy for anybody I know of, even people I'm close to or I know success. And with that being said, you leave Tech, you get drafted, correct? Right? Well, I went as a free agent. You went as a free agent, okay. Um, it seemed like everybody, you went to Minnesota. Um, mm -hmm. That's why I saw drafted, because I remember Tori and Gray and Antonio Banks. Uh, uh, no, I got, I went in as a free agent to Tampa. But I got the call from, I got the call from, uh, from Minnesota first. And that, and that's how that twisted that. But when I got the call from a hometown kid by the name of Mike Tomlin, to go to, to go to play with the Bucks. My family was like, hold up. He from Newport News. I know him. my uncles knew him. My, my uncle Mike, my uncle Mike Wills, who played baseball, two-time All-American baseball at William & Mary. He knew who Mike Tomlin was. Yeah. yeah. And I was at my uncle Mike's house when we was watching this. He was like, that's, that's Tomlin. He from Newport News. I know who he is. And, and, and that's how. But if you look at it, think about it. I get a call from one team. Nothing. I get a call from a kid from Newport News, from bad news, and he is all bad news. People can, people can look at him talk on ESPN right now, but people know if you take that mask up, if you take pull that flare back, it's Newport News under <laughs> there is, all day. He is, he is, he is. So you know, as we as we as we end, you know, in your in, end up in uh, Tampa, you go to Tampa, your NFL career. I mean, at the end of the day, how was it playing? We played in NFL Europe. I remember you had a great. Great run in NFL Europe. Uh, you know, in the NFL, why I was was it? how was it? It was awesome. Oh. I mean, going into, when I got into Tampa, I was able to ease my way in there, you know, but I had, I, I wanted to impress because I knew the coach who called me to, um, to get me there. I knew he was a 757 guy. I knew my family. So I wanted to do more to impress him. Until he, one day he told me, no, nah, do more to keep your job. And that's when I understood that this was a job now. This is a way to support. This is the way to put food on the table, clothes on back, you know what I mean, roofs on houses. That's what this was all about, you know. So I had to get out of that college mindset and plan for scholarships and understand that I'm playing for a livelihood of my life and my job, you know. And being able to be there with him kind of prepared me for what the next step was, which after three years there was with the Vikings for two years. And I remember Mike Tomlin telling me, Ron Whitaker is a poor man's Rondé Barber, you know? Mm. And, and I was, cause Rondé was, Ron, like to this day, Rondé is like my idol. Like I wanted, I tried to make my game like his, the way I blitz, the way I make people miss, you know, the way I, different techniques and press coverage or off coverage or what are my eyes looking at, you know? And, when he left, he was like, "If I ever get a hit, if I ever get a defensive back, I mean, a defensive coordinator job or a head coach job, I'm gonna come get you." I took that as one ear and out the other because I knew how. To, I, after my third year with the Bucks, I kind of knew that okay, how this game is played. And sometimes people can say stuff that you know it yeah. is what it is. He got that job with the Vikings. I was there day one. Signed me day one, two year deal. After that, went on to Detroit. Finished in Detroit you know, on the 0-16 and all that other crap. And the rest was history, man, as far as that particular life. You know what I mean? As far as football was concerned. Now it was all about how do I step into the next form of life? You know what I mean? And that's where we went from there after after football. And after football, what's happened? Like, what is the form of life meant for you now? What is that? It? What is that? Well, got into real estate, started to get into some sales. You know, uh, it was an opportunity where, you know, we came up with someone we would be able to help pro athletes kind of, you know, get settled in different states and different places and things of that nature. And we just ran off with that. You know, uh, my people can say what they want to say as far as retirement, no matter how much money you got or whatever, you retire, you retire. And, you know, when I retire, I'm going to just sit on my butt and I ain't going to do nothing. You know what I mean? I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to just chill on the dough and just chill. You go on to do that so long when you watch your wife who, who has numerous degrees and masters and all this other stuff, watch her go to work every day because she likes to work and, and come home <laughs> and you either doing this or you doing this. You, you know what I mean? And, and my grandfather would have rolled over in his, in his grave if he would have knew that that's what I was doing when I'm capable. 
I'm capable. It's not like I left this game and I'm 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 like limping or you know I got all these ailments going on. You know I was able. So once I was able to do that, I I, I thought that like sales would be the next best thing for me because one I love being around people. Two I love helping people and and ha- hoping that they can live a better life and have a be- better opportunity no matter what it is. You know and that just led on into me you know having an opportunity to go coach at Chanhassen High you know, and, and bring that same mentality into that as far as coaching was concerned and understood that I don't want to be, I don't want to be the coach that worry about how many games we win. I want to be the coach that worry about how many students we graduate, you know, and that was, that came from the tech mentality, the Mike Gentry mentality, the U.S. needs bringing food over there mentality, the Andre Kendrick mentality, or tell me what, it, all that stuff started to resonate to me and understand that now in this full circle, you know, because I tell a lot of people now, all of that that I did in that time, and, and you know, and even now, the riches is not about how many commas that you have in your bank account. The riches are the circle of people you're able to surround yourself with. That that Those are your riches because when the money is gone, how many of these people in this circle I can call and say, I need you. I need help. I, I am down and out. And they will open that circle and let us right in. Those are your riches. Those are the those are the zeros you should be worried about. You know what I mean? Not the ones that's in a bank account. You know, so that's how I look at life. Life has been great for me. You know, I, I wouldn't change my role, you know, whether it's from Young's part to, you know, my mom and my dad dealing with their stuff to being evicted to, you know, all of that stuff. I wouldn't change it for the world because it gave me an opportunity to meet people along this great road. And my road is long. I, I still got, you know, more people to meet and more people to see. You know, and that and that's a big mm-hmm. part of what I tell people about the circle is when they watch these victory lives, you got to understand and listen to the stories and understand that these roads, you know, you go through villages, you know, you know how they say it takes a village, but when these roads when you're going through, whether someone who has cancer, who beats cancer, you know, and, and things of that, and they, like I've, I've watched all these victory lives, you know, and I understand everything that's going through and I, and I listen to these stories and I'm like, just when you think your story was like bad as somebody else, that went through something worse. You just have to understand how can I put that all into perspective where I'm understanding not just their story, but just their life. You know what I mean? So that's the way I look at it, man. And, 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 and what you're doing right now and being able to use your platform to allow us to tell these stories and allow for people to come into this and, and understand Those architect students, they didn't just know me as Deuce. They knew me as Ron Yale, too. Not Ron Yale Whitaker, just as Ron Yale. You, you know what I mean? So it was, it was able to get a road and meet all those people, you know what I mean, and, and understand that, yeah, they do look like architects, but they party with the best of them, you know what I mean? And, <laughs> and, and, and they understood who Deuce was, too. You know, like, this guy's just – this is just a persona on Saturdays. You know what I mean? This is who the guy really is, you know, and it took – it, it takes for a lot of understanding of that. And I think these victory life stories give people just that. Because to this day, people still think, man, are, are you kind of an asshole? You know, and I'm like, no, that's Deuce. That's Deuce. That's Deuce. No, nah. I'm a great guy, man. Look, my name Ron, man. I'm a great guy, you know. But but with you doing this and using your platform, it shows us in a bigger light. It, it gives us an opportunity to tell people, hey, this is who I really am. This is what really happened to me. You you know Mm -hmm. what I mean? These are the people that helped curve me into the man that I am today. So we appreciate that. Well, I I can only speak for myself, but after watching the other ones, I know they appreciate it too. But this this is big time, man. My wife will tell you, I woke up early for this. I was excited. I was excited. Well, you know what? Hey, this has been a great, great show today, man. And tell your wife, um, I appreciate her. You can bring her in. Serena. I don't know. I never know what she's doing. I never know what she's doing back there, like on Wedding Crashers. I never know what she's doing back there. (laughs) Hey, but no, I'm telling you, man, like, um, we had some great memories today. I was there a year, then I came back and helped out before moving on, man. But um, I was looking forward to this, man. Um, I'm glad and blessed to see you doing so well and married and making moves and just having an impact on life. And I appreciate you being a guest on the show today, your story, your journey. I know we're not done yet. 
Um, but I appreciate you. And um, there are other people that when we had this later today, are going to appreciate your insight, your stories. And it's always something that like you mentioned the back back stories to other people. That's what I love about doing this because a lot of the guests I have one I know, but there's still so much I didn't know. And that's why it's been insightful, man. So I just want to say thank you again, man. This has been fun. Um, I will air it today. And I know from the streets of Norfolk all the way to the streets of Christiansburg in Minnesota, people are going to appreciate it, man. Yeah, man. And I appreciate having me on, man. I gotta find I, now. I gotta go find some way to get this off my face, man. I, my, my brother, look, I'm, I saw Mike put his head down the other day. I said, "Oh," because I told, I said, "I'm putting on a hat." I said, "I look like Samuel L. Jackson on Black Snake Moan." <laughs> hey, listen. What's funny is I'm not taking my hat off. Normally, if this is a normal time, I would have my hat off. I don't, you know. I'm not trying to disrespect my mom, my grandmother. You know, I'm not taking my head off in the building, but I'm not doing it. <laughs> not until my barber Wayne opens back up, man. Told you not to take that head off on picture day. You know your mama said <laughs> She did, but it ain't happening. It ain't happening. Not no. Hey, this is about look, and I don't know about I don't nobody lose focus. Like, what is going on with Vic's head? Where's his hairline at? It's disappeared. You know what I'm saying? So but on that note, man, to everybody watching, man, everybody that checked out this video, no matter where you go, no matter what you do, make sure you leave a legacy. Thanks for Absolutely. watching. Have a good one.